Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining today's session on Women's Wellness Checklist. But before we begin, uh, let me wish everyone a very happy and healthy Women's Day. Uh, we are Noah, and today we have partnered with UV Health, which is our tech first platform for all women's need and health. Thank you so much, UV team. Um, and Noah is an employee wellness platform with a core focus centered on health insurance. We also help organizations improve employee well-being through a variety of wellness programs, such as daily fitness and mental health counseling. Today, we have uh, Dr. Deepa Vinay Nambir with us. Thank you, Doctor, for joining us. Uh, Dr. Deepa is an OBGYN and infertility specialist with over 11 years of experience. She is an expert at UV Health, which is a digital therapeutics platform that offers personalized and science-backed comprehensive and holistic care for chronic conditions. Dr. Deepa is also associated with Shanti Women's Healthcare Center, Motherhood Hospital, Cloud9 Hospital, and Ovum Hospital for healthcare services. For everybody attending this session, if you have any questions during the session, please feel free to drop a message in the chat box, or you can DM me or Aisha personally as well. Over to you, Doctor. Um, Dr. Deepa, uh, you can take over the session. Okay. So, hello everyone. I hope, uh, wishing all of you all a very happy Women's Day. And uh, it's my pleasure to be a part of this so that I can at least help in some way to educate you all about when and how you all should actually go about taking care of your health. So, first thing first is we actually go ahead with a preventive health checkup in the sense that everyone needs to you all know that prevention is better than cure. So these things that what you ask yourself is one, when was your last annual checkup done? How often do you consult your primary physician and gynecologist? Usually in India here, it's actually easier for you all to directly come to a gynecologist uh, rather than what they do abroad, that they first go to the family physician and then they get referred. So you should actually take the advantage that we are available for you all. And do you know your family history, your immediate family history or your a distant family history of, of having any kind of carcinomas like cancers or any other problems that you could relate to so that you can prevent anything that from happening in the next few years. So why is this important? One is it because it helps you to be proactive about your health. It can decrease your risk of diseases, allows you to take preventive measures to reduce or prevent un unplanned medical expenses in the future. So why give it a chance also to spend money on your health in the sense, do it preventively so that you can prevent uh, health conditions from happening than going for the cure. So 70% of serious health conditions faced by women are preventable. So the major thing is the lack of awareness and information about regular health checkups. That is the one which is a problem in our society. So the conditions that we usually come across in the OPD is one, patients come in with thyroid problems, they come in with sexually transmitted diseases, they come with polycystic ovaries, endometriosis, and the less common causes like cervical cancer, breast cancer, and uterine cancer are something that at least after awareness, they get to know about. Yeah, so the three less talked about aspects of your health that matter in your 20s, 30s, and your 40s and beyond, the major thing for women especially is reproductive health, sexual health, and chronic disorders. So in reproductive health, basically what we talk about is your periods. Because your periods are the first thing that will tell us about whether anything is going wrong with your menstrual cycle or not. So the signs of your menstrual health that you should not ignore are irregular cycles, spotting, excessive cramping or pain that you may not be able to control or handle even with medication, very less flow, in increased prolongation of your duration of your periods and in excessive clotting. So these are the things that when, if you come across, you should visit your gynecologist. You explain, many people are actually worried and scared about visiting a gynecologist, but I feel that this generation of gynecologists are a little more open and less judgmental. So you should definitely be open up to your doctor about your history. Do not hide anything from your history because that makes a big difference. Get necessary health checkups and screenings to get a proper diagnosis. 
and follow your prescription and course of treatment. It's just not medication all the time because right now lifestyle modifications is the thing that we need to have a lot of importance to. So your reproductive health in the sense when you reach menopause, especially nowadays when people are working uh, longer hours and I've been seeing a lot of patients who are having early menopause. Sometimes even young patients as young as 24 and 26 are actually showing some signs of menopause, which we call as premature menopause. So always know that there is something like that and you can at least get checked once in a while, like yearly once, go visit your gynec to prevent these things. Your stages of actual menopause is somewhere which comes around 45 years and plus. So that is perimenopause, menopause and postmenopause. So perimenopause is between 45 to 50. Menopause is usually between 50 to 60 and postmenopause is when your period completely stops for at least one year. So symptoms of menopause are irregular periods, mood swings, low libido, hot flashes and vaginal dryness. All this happens because of the lack of estrogen and progesterone hormones. Now the health risk that happens, so all these hormones actually produced by the ovaries are very protective for women. So when these hormones drop, one is that you will have a higher risk of heart diseases. That's why we don't see women having a lot of heart problems before the age of 50. It's because of these protective hormones. Another thing is that you will have a chance of having osteoporosis. That is, your bones will start weakening. There is a chance of urinary incontinence and urinary tract infection due to the vaginal dryness. And incontinence can be because of various other reasons that I will be telling you in the future. So reproductive health cancers now. Now the main cancers for a female usually are the breast cancer, cervical cancer, ovarian cancer and uterine cancer. Now coming to each one of them, cervical cancer accounts for around 6 to 29% and the diagnosis is usually by pelvic examination, pap smear and biopsy. But the problem with cervical cancer is it might not actually give a lot of symptoms. So what happens is that you tend to ignore it. So when by the time we diagnose the cervical cancer, it becomes very late. Probably you wouldn't even have known that it would have started growing like in a year back or so. But only when you come and get examined and get a pap smear done, do we know that whether there are some changes in the cells of the cervical smear. So how do you go about it? The one good thing about this is that we do have a cervical cancer prevention vaccine and you should take it even, I admit, almost all patients that when your daughters are from 9 to 11 years old, you need only two doses. More than 11 years old till whatever age, especially this works best is when before the, their first sexual contact. So after which also you can take. So the main reason between cervical cancer is four major viruses, which this vaccine actually takes care of. But even if you, are not, if you haven't had the chance to take it, you can take the, this vaccine even up to the age of 45 because other vac there are other viruses also that cause this cancer. So this is the thing about cervical cancer. Your breast cancer is something that you should be very, very careful about because th this is something that you yourself can examine on a monthly basis. So once your periods are done, you can under the shower, or that's the best time because it gives you more mobility and you can actually find out if any lumps or any kind of changes are there in the breast. Self-examination is very important, after which if you have a doubt, you can consult a doctor and they will suggest whether an ultrasound or a mammography or an MRI is done. And mostly the patients who come with the, to us, are they show very benign lesions and a simple FNAC that is which we take out cells with a needle will tell us if it is something to be worried of and the treatment is best early. Same thing with ovarian cancer. Now you can't find out what's happening. The first sign that you will have is in your periods. That is your change in the cycle length or the amount of bleeding or the pain. So the best way to examine this is one by a pelvic examination and then go in for an ultrasound. Only if required, we again go in for an MRI and then regular screening is very important for ovarian cancer. And even ovarian cysts also doesn't mean that every ovarian cyst is cancer. So you need to find out what kind of cyst you have and make sure that you follow up so that you don't have to go in for further treatment. Uterine cancers are the ones which is the lesser incidence of. So pelvic examination, transvaginal ultrasound or normal ultrasound will tell us if anything is wrong with the inner lining of the uterus. And regular screening is the only way by which we can diagnose this. So your reproductive health, like breast cancer, now the main things that you all should understand is the risk factors. So many educated people also fail to tell us the history that their immediate, that their mother or their aunts or anyone who's closely related to them in the family, genetics plays a very big role in breast cancer. 
So if you do have a breast cancer victim in the family, it is always best to discuss with your doctor. There are other tests which can tell us whether you actually have a high risk of developing breast cancer. So the screening that is done most commonly is mammography. Ultrasound is done in cases which we don't have a doubt. And the best way is for MRI in high-risk patients. Self-examination is conducted by women across from 20s to their 40s and should be done throughout life also. And clinical breast cancer screening should be a part of your annual physical checkup by a doctor up till you hit your 40s. And after that, if you have a doubt, you can definitely meet your doctor whenever. Now, the sexual health, when we come to that point, the four major points that you all should understand is one is preventing sexually transmitted diseases, preventing unwanted pregnancy and good pelvic health and pleasure. So the common sexual, sexually transmitted diseases are chlamydia, genital herpes, gonorrhea, syphilis, hepatitis, as well as HPV. Now, the testing is the only way that we get to know. So again, there are many patients who totally avoid this content and they don't they feel bad to reveal how many partners they've had or whatever it is but that keeping that aside you should understand that your health is very important when it comes to your these kind of infections because these infections are all ascending infections in the sense that it starts off at the vagina and it can go right into your uterus into your tubes and even fall into the abdomen that is when all the problems increase and this can cause sepsis also which is life-threatening so if you do have any a history of multiple partners or you're starting a new relationship you always it's better to discuss this with your partner and if you have been exposed to an infection you please get tested immediately and get the hpv vaccine that is something that i would urge every woman to do now preventing unwanted pregnancy this is also very important now among all the methods that we have for contraception the only one method which actually helps protect against sexually transmitted diseases is the condom that is either the external or the internal condom. But again, the chances of the, that is the efficacy of this is 98%, but mostly 3% of failure is there, which we all, which we find a little difficult that, to convince patients that this is the best way. So some people say that using double barrier method it will help, but again, that is false. So hormonal methods is using the pill or patches or a vaginal ring. This has a good percentage of uh, safety, even 0.3% of failure is what is recorded but the protection against sexually transmitted diseases is not there. Again, intrauterine devices, before they used to be pretty big in size and cause other problems. And still women have a lot of misconception that they will put on weight if they put on a copper tea, or they will have an irregular kind of spotting or bleeding or infection. But right now in this generation, what the copper teas that come are very small, very safe to use, and is one of the best things I would advise my patients. Now, maintaining pelvic health is very important in your 20s. See, pelvic health is just basically not cleanliness that you use V-Wash every day and it's fine. It's not that. So in the basic muscles that protect all your pelvic organs, that is your bladder, the bowel and the uterus. Now, basically, there was a saying that, you know, God has made it in such a way that the entertainment is in between the sanitary system. So your bladder and your uterus and your bowel is all in the same line. So when you have any kind of weakness in the muscles, all these organs start to prolapse. So in your 20s, your pelvic health is at the best. But again, heavy weight lifting, like nowadays, a lot of people are going to the gym and doing a lot of exercises and it's good for them, but they do fail to realize what is right and what is wrong. So women who lift very heavy weights have a definite risk of reducing their pelvic strength. And the best way to do this is go for Kegel's exercise. I think all of you all know what Kegel's exercise is. In your 30s, that is a part where it's the worst because childbirth, whether it be vaginal delivery or whether it be a cesarean section, vaginal delivery definitely has a more impact and strain on the muscles, but a cesarean section is something that doesn't affect it that much, but you will still have some kind of weakness. So pelvic floor exercises are very important. Beyond your 40s, again, once you start... Yeah. So beyond your 40s, again, menopause can weaken your pelvic floor muscles and this can cause urinary incontinence. So this basically means that you're not able to control your urine. And even if your bladder gets a little fill, full, that is when you want to cough or you sneeze or you laugh, there is a little bit of leak. So the only ways that you can tackle this is by doing Kegels on a regular basis. So chronic health problems, now PCOD is something which is very, very prevalent. It's almost seen in one in five women and I 
probably see at least eight women per day. And this starts off even as young as 11, 12 years old that I'm seeing right now. So what you need to do is if you have these symptoms, basically abnormal weight gain, especially around the abdomen, irregular periods, acne, hirsutism, that is facial hair, hair loss, mood swings, uh, pre-diabetic symptoms like increased thirst, increased urination. Uh, you, should, you might feel very, you know, very weakened or very fatigued, even though you're not doing much and chronic stress. So why this is important is because this is a metabolic disorder. It's just not that I have PCOD and it is only related to my period. No, this is a metabolic disorder which affects all your organs. So why, th why this is important is one, to prevent any kind of future problems such as diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular problems, lipid profile problems that can lead to plaques and uh, other kind of coronary artery disease. So these things that we should be really careful about and testing for PCO again, there it depends on something also known as a Rotterdam criteria, which has three things. So if you have two of the following of the three, one is your irregular cycles, hyperandrogenism, and any and your scan findings of a polycystic ovary, that confirms that you do have polycystic ovaries. But sometimes with PCO, your periods might be regular, but you have other symptoms. So the only thing to do is start off finding out whether exactly what kind of polycystic ovary you have and how to tackle it, starting off with lifestyle modifications first and then going into what kind of medication that you need. So the next thing that comes is thyroid problems. Again, 10 to 20% of Indian women suffer from hypothyroidism. The symptoms of which are basically irregular cycles, again, weight gain, fatigue, dry skin, puffy face, high cholesterol levels, thinning of the hair, painful joints. So these things, again, are a generalized thing. It's just not to do with your thyroid gland. So why should you care about this is, again, Thyroid problems are best tackled before you plan for a pregnancy. If you some patients who feel that they don't need to take medication, they may go in for Ayurveda or homeopathy and it can get controlled for a period of time. But as you keep growing in your age, definitely there will be changes and you do need the thyroxine ta tablet. The main hormone that you need is not there. So if you take your medication on time, as well as follow the orders of the doctor, that you, your endocrinologist, you should be able to tackle this. And the best way to screen this is a thyroid panel. And once your TSH levels comes to normal, you will have to check your TSH level once in six months. Chronic health condition number three is endometriosis. About 25 million Indian women suffer from endometriosis, but I don't think none of them open their mouth and tell exactly what their problem is because all of them are shunned saying that it's periods, it's pain, just deal with it or take in a tablet. So when this is important is because one, they have very pain, painful periods. They have pain even during sexual intercourse. They have pain even while passing motion. They might have pain while passing urine. And sometimes the pain is that excessive that they have bouts of vomiting. They have bouts of even fainting episodes. So why this is important is because when you have your period, mostly the endometrial lining is shed from the uterine cavity through the vagina. But what happens in some patients, for all of us actually, 10% of it can have a retrograde flow where it goes back and falls into the abdomen. But some people can develop this kind of reaction where they form endometriosis. So basically everything in the pelvis is stuck to each other. That is why you have this pain. And if you don't treat this on time, it's definitely going to grow worse. And it, be, it may lead to something known as a frozen pelvis in which there is, that means everything is stuck. All your organs are stuck to each other. So you can imagine the pain that they go through. Now, why should you care? One thing is to prevent pro further problems. Another one is infertility, which is very commonly seen in endometriosis, early onset of menopause and chronic pain. So chronic pain is such that even giving tablets will not work, injections won't work. So they the last resort for this is something to go and cut the nerves that are actually reaching these, these organs. Now, the test for screening are full pelvic examination and an ultrasound to check this. But sometimes even an ultrasound, you may not find anything. And the only way to go about this is through a laparoscopy. Now, things you can do are one, schedule regular screenings and preventive tests. Keep track of family medical history to plan for proactive measures. Start building healthy habits and make lifestyle modifications for your better health in the future. Now, the four types of preventive health checkups that you need as a woman, this is for your good reproductive, sexual and chronic health, pap smear, a pelvic exam, ultrasound and blood test. Now, when you walk into your gynec also, the first thing they will do is take a history and after which they will tell you what a pap smear is. 
what a pelvic exam is and you don't need to be scared about it because all they have to do is calm you down and make sure that we're just going to examine you to find out how the cervical health is, what is the size of your uterus. We will go in to find out, do an ultrasound to make sure that there's no other co uh, fibroids or, you know, there are different kind of problems that can be associated with the uterus and the ovaries, which can be clearly seen on an ultrasound. And blood tests are given only if required. So a pap smear, usually we tell any kind, any patient who is sexually active beyond the age of 20, we do ask them that they can get it done every three years. And once it's normal in three years, they can do it once in three years and up to the age of 50. And then it can be once in five years. Same thing with the pelvic exam. It doesn't mean that you need a pelvic exam every year, but yes, it is always better because sometimes you might know, not know what kind of skin changes are there or what kind of growth is there until a later stage. And an ultrasound is obviously done every year as an annual checkup, which is always good because we can find out any other problems in the whole abdomen. I think you could go to the next slide. Yeah, so I think this is, we come to the end of this. And my only uh, thing that I need to tell you in this session, one thing is we have one cancer that we can actually prevent. Cervical cancer is something that can no, no longer exist probably 50 years from now. But that is provided you take the vaccine, which again, patients are so scared about or they don't know about. So please vaccinate your daughters. Make sure that your sisters and your mom and you yourself can take the vaccine and talk to your doctor about it. Get your screening done regularly and have a very safe and healthy period and a very, very happy Women's Day again. Take the supplement you, shake, you take should not be that strong that you take it and avoid drinking water and develop renal stones. Now that's what I see in most of the young patients who are taking supplements. They fail to drink water so what happens this extra salts go in and deposit even in your gallstones or either in your renal stones. So make sure that you drink enough water, take calcium supplements, maintain a good exercise routine because that also gives your skeletal system a lot of strength. That should be more than enough for now. Uh, so another question is, can uh, fibroadenomas, I'm not sure if I'm uh, pronouncing it right, uh, turn cancerous? And how do we diagnose this at uh, an early stage? And is it uh, inflammation a sign for that? Okay. Uh, fibroadenomas rarely change to cancer, but nothing can be like, you know, we cannot avoid a fact that they can, be, can, they can turn into cancer cells later on. That is why a yearly checkup should be done. And it, only if the fibroadenoma keeps growing at a rapid stage, like suppose if you had it only at two centimeters and in a year it's grown up to almost eight, nine centimeters, it's always better to get it removed because you don't need that mass staying there and you know changing its cells. So a yearly checkup with your doctor is always the best way to go and a mammogram definitely tell us what kind of problem it is. And your fibroadenoma will definitely have been diagnosed by an FNAC. So I think this should sum it up. Uh, so another question uh, that I got uh, is that uh, like excess discharge, like excess vaginal discharge, is it harmful or uh, like how can we diagnose that? And is, it, is it a problem? Okay. See, actually vaginal discharge, it varies from patient to patient, from woman to woman. So some patients don't have discharge even throughout their cycle. But some women have very active uh, hormones in the way they actually have, you know, the vaginal discharge premenstrually, postmenstrually, during ovulation. So the only thing you should know is that you should find out what is the kind of discharge. That is whether it is just normal uh, egg white kind of discharge, which is not foul smelling, which has no kind of irritation, then it should be fine. But until unless it's something that, you know, you would know that what's putting it off, then you need to get checked up. Mostly if it's bacterial vaginosis, that, that is mainly not an infection, but a shift in the vaginal flora. So some patients use Savlon and Dettol and very harmful soaps <coughs> as their private parts, which definitely should, causes a shift. And that is the one which causes this kind of excessive discharge. So that's the way of your body telling you that something is wrong. So just make sure that you know the cycle of how your discharge is. And if you have any doubt, go get a checkup done. Okay, so one question from my side, uh, like 
there are many uh, fee wash and all those things. So do you recommend that to your patients or uh, to regular people? Yeah. It is actually good. See, the thing is how people use it. There are ladies who take in like, you know, a whole palm full and use it. That is not what is supposed to be done. It's just like the tip of your finger, right? Just a little bit will do morning once and night once. And basically why they're telling you to use it is because it maintains the pH. That is your acidic pH of the vagina. So once, if that becomes basic, that means you are giving chance for other infections to come in. So by using this, it is definitely safe. Don't overuse it. Even once a day is also more than enough. So how to self-diagnose uh, a breast cancer? So, okay, you cannot diagnose breast cancer, but you can definitely find out if there is any kind of abnormality. So what you do every month is make sure that you stand in front of a mirror, okay? And once you're in the shower, you can see both, whether you have to first check whether both sides of the breast are equal in size, whether there's any kind of irregularity. Check the skin for any kind of inflamed uh, arteries or any kind of vessels that you can see. Check if there's any kind of bluish pigmentation, any kind of discharge from the nipple. And once you start palpating, you palpate from the axilla, from your armpit, you go in a clockwise fashion so that if you can make out any kind of lump. Now there's a difference between a fat lump and an actual growth. Fat lump will be very soft, very irregular, but a growth will be something that you can hold in your hand. So if you feel any kind of that kind of thing, you should definitely go into a doctor and get a second opinion so that you're clear in your head that nothing is wrong. Oh. So how safe is IOD? Yeah, I know you mentioned, but still people are hesitant, I'm sure. Yeah. Intrauterine devices are very safe, are pretty safe, 0.3% of safe failure rate only. And if, the thing is that you also should maintain hygiene. So what patients do sometimes is that they put in the property and they're like, okay, fine, everything is okay. But they fail to maintain hygiene. So like I said, any infection, especially vaginal infections are all ascending infections. So through your vagina, whatever infection is there can go in through the your property also and enter into the uterus. So these things can should be avoided. Other than that, it's very, very safe. And I've not had any patients give any major complaints. So it's good. Uh, yeah, so um, how do we know that the ovarian cyst is not cancerous? Now, it depends again on the size of the cyst and what kind of cyst it is. So even if you have a simple cyst, which is around 10 centimeters also, which, which is only containing fluid in it, it might not be cancerous. And there are certain markers that we look when we do the um, ultrasound. But basically, your symptoms are the ones that come first. Like if it is a carcinoma, one is your loss of appetite, your loss of weight, you can have irregularities in your periods, either pain or heavy bleeding or no bleeding sometimes. So what happens then after you come to the doctor, we check your ultrasound, we see how the color doppler is, that is the flow to the ovaries. If there's any solid component in it, what kind of fluid is inside? And if we have a doubt, we go in for an MRI. So in the MRI, we will exactly get to know what it is. And depending on the stage of it, we either plan for a uh, surgery or we can plan for any other therapy that you require. Right. Um, I think there's another question uh, which is regarding a lot of weight can after childbirth and how can they lose it? Okay, a lot of weight after ch after childbirth. Okay, during pregnancy, another thing is that, you know, people tend to put on weight, they eat for two and these things should be, should not be, that's the biggest blunder that we can do is eating for two in pregnancy because you need extra calories, you need extra nutrients, but you don't need double of that. But now since after childbirth, it is difficult. It's not easy taking care of a child, feeding the child as well as taking care of your body. So I would tell all my patients, give yourselves a six month break. Don't go in too much into the weight right now. Just make sure that you eat healthy because that is very important. And after the six months, you can start off with very small exercises, depending on whether you've had a vaginal or a cesarean section. And the best exercise to start off with is walking. So start off with a 15 minute walk, increase it to 20, 30 minutes and Consistency is the thing that is going to help you lose weight. So with that, along with the dietitian, it, it will definitely work. Just give yourself time. You're a new mother, so just enjoy that period. Um, we have a couple of questions around thyroid and PCOS. So one would be if they're related to each other yeah. and how do they improve it? Yeah, see polycystic ovaries, again, it is a metabolic disorder. So it affects every organ in the body. So we have seen that many patients with PCO also come in to have hypothyroidism. 
So the only way like you can tackle it off, I know everyone's fed up of hearing lose weight, lose weight, but it's not only about weight, it's about your total lifestyle modification. If you put in all these factors together, only then it will work. It's just not by losing weight and you have high levels of stress or you're not eating healthy or you are not sleeping well. These are not going to help. So along with your thyroid medication, if you are hypothyroidism, taking care of your PCO by taking the right medication or supplement also will definitely work. And keeping a track of it and every year will make sure that it doesn't aggravate more. Um, I also think you mentioned the excess of PCOS, so there's a question around that as well. The three exams, is it? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, so it's known as the Rotterdam's criteria. So where it see doesn't mean if you see a PC polycystic ovarian uh, looking ovary on the scan that you do have PCO. Along with that, you should have other symptoms like your periods, irregular periods, once in two months, once in three months. Or you should have hyperandrogenism, that is, increase in the male hormones, which manifests as hair loss, as uh, your abnormal hair growth on your chin or on your breasts or on your and all abnormal places that you will on your abdomen. These kind of things show that there's an increased level of testosterone. So when you have these, at least two of these three, that means you do definitely do have PCO and you should take the right treatment. Uh, we have a lot of more questions, but we'll just take one minute and run one of the polls. Yeah. And if anybody has any feedback on the session, they can, of course, feel free to tell us. And if you have any similar topics that you know the audience would want to engage us with, you can yeah. drop the same on the comments while the poll is going on. We'll just take up the questions in a minute. Uh, yeah. So we'll just get back to the questions. So yeah. are uh, pills a safe solution for PCOS or PCOD? Yeah, again, firstly, you start off with nutritional supplements and if that works along with your lifestyle, that's great. Otherwise, if it is required, you do have to take tablets that your doctor prescribes. One is they start off either with metformin or minoestrol, or they can also go for oral contraceptive pills, which will reduce the size of the ovarian cysts and definitely help you with getting your periods on track. Um, the next question is at what age should one start getting an annual health checkup? Any specific test that you would recommend? Yeah, so again, depending on your family history, whether your parents are diabetic or hypertensive or any kind of cardiac disease or anything at all like that, you should know that you should get tested even as early as 20 years old. I Like I said, I'm getting patients as young as 12 and 13 with PCO. So that's something that you should worry about if you have daughters or if you have you know, the younger ones in your family. So make sure that you get tested at least once yearly if you are at the high risk group. Otherwise, once in two years is more than enough if you basically follow a healthy lifestyle and your weight is in the... Right. Um, I think the next question is name of the vaccine. That's HPV, right? Yeah. So basically, there were there was Cervarix and Gardasil, but now there's only Gardasil that's coming out, and you can take it as a three dose course. So that's one at if you take one now, then one after two months, and one after. So it's all done in a six month course. So zero, two, and four. Um, I think you mentioned a supplement at some point. If somebody wants a name for that. Supplement is like see, if you go online, actually there are a lot of. Uh, companies that are coming up with natural supplements. One is Hera, one is Gynoveda, and there are a few other things. One is Allopath. So these basically are Ayurvedic supplements or nutritional supplements, which are not medicine, in fact. So you can start off with that to just, you know, that you don't have to think that I'm taking medication for it, but it will definitely help you in some way. So these are the things what I'm referring to. Uh, one question, my, my, my question uh, would be... Um, there's so irritation in bowel movements and have been on medication as well. But uh, whenever the person eats fast food, 
they feel a pain and it gets normal in three to four days. So what should the person yeah. ideally do? So this actually sounds like either an irritable bowel syndrome. So you have to be very careful depending on you, you know, what you eat. And unfortunately, you can't eat fast food as much as you want because it's going to cause irritation, and then the next one or two weeks of yours will be off. So you might have to find out exactly what is giving you this problem, whether it's gluten or whether it is uh, lactose or anything that is irritating your bowel and try to avoid it as much as possible. Um, is it necessary for vaginal health to wash private parts before and after intercourse? And is it uh, necessary as an everyday routine? It's better, see, any kind of, your hygiene is very important before you have sex and as well as after you have sex. So I would definitely suggest all patients do it. It is good to do it because you're preventing any kind of unnecessary infection either from your partner as well as you. The same thing should be done even by your partner, it's just not you. So no matter how clean you are, if your partner is not keeping the private parts clean and does not wash before you are together, again, the reintroduction of infection will come to you. Uh, the next question we have is around breast set and if sagging of one is normal or abnormal. It depends again on your uh, age and whether you breastfed or not. So sagging is something which happens because of the wear and tear of the tissue. So there are, you can't say oils and exercises which will definitely make it firm again, not like that, but it can make it better. Uh, upward massaging of the breast as well as doing pectoral exercises that uh, either push-ups or onto on the wall also will definitely give you some kind of change. But it is normal. There is nothing abnormal about it. Um, would casual spotting be common at the age of 45 and if that is a sign of menopause? Sorry, I didn't get that. Casual spotting at 45. See, sometimes spotting can happen even during your ovulation. So there's nothing to be worried about it. Uh, until unless it's giving you a lot of problem like itching or any foul discharge or it's irritating you that you have to make, wear a panty liner all the time. So in that case, but otherwise there's no problem. Um, you wanted some recommendations for your Kegel exercises? There's only one exercise to do in Kegel exercise. So basically how you do it is like when you pass urine, when you suddenly want to stop passing urine, how do you, the muscles that you want to stop the urination, those are the muscles that you need to clench. So that is one way or you can keep a ball in between your thighs when you're lying down and press the ball with both your thighs. So this also causes a little bit of strengthening, but you can get how, how to go about Kegels online and they do show you exactly how it works. There's a quick follow-up question to the spotting and uh, a person says it's been continuing for a month and if it's serious. Yeah, if it is continuing for a month, you should get checked because sometimes very small growths like cervical polyps also can cause this kind of spotting. And uh, if you don't treat it, it's going to just remain there and unnecessary change in cells. So the best thing is to get checked. And if it is a polyp, you can just get it out done in an OPD procedure. Um, a little brief on ovarian cyst and ovarian cancer and if it's treatable in stage, uh, stage one. Yeah, so again, ovarian cysts, like I said, there are so many different kinds of cysts. So cancer in the sense is when it changes into cancerous cells. So at stage one, definitely it's treatable and the prognosis also is very good when you find it out early on. So only when it becomes late stage, it becomes messy and, you know, it's very difficult to treat even with surgery. So if you have a simple cyst, taking medication at the right time will prevent it from growing in size. Depending on the size of cyst, some cysts cannot reduce in size even with medication. So getting it done sur sur surgically, like removing it at an early stage is better than going, waiting. And, you know, there are many patients who again keep waiting, saying that, let's see after one year, let's see after one year, please don't do that. You can take two, three opinions if you want, if you're not satisfied with one doctor giving you the advice and then go ahead with the best thing. How can someone improve the chances of getting pregnant with PCOS? See, polycystic ovaries doesn't mean that you will not get pregnant naturally. It just means that your cycles may be irregular or you don't know exactly when you're ovulating. But if you have a 30 day to 40 day cycle, you can definitely get to know when you need to start being together, that is from your day 10 to day 20 of your period, on every alternate day, not even every day, that gap, if you give, at least you have a chance of 25% of pregnancy every month. So by trying for one year, we can definitely aim for a pregnancy, a healthy pregnancy, which should not have, have any problem. 
but in polycystic ovaries along with trying make sure that you're taking enough folic acid as well as continue your lifestyle modification so that it doesn't have any kind of negative income impact right um i think there was a weight gain question where there's a follow-up which uh talks about not having any thyroid or diabetes issues would you want to address that <clears throat> okay so that again may be genetics also so Unfortunately, everyone have go through that, right? Suddenly, post delivery or post any kind of stress, even post COVID, also many of us have put on around five to ten kgs. So that's something that you have to sit in with a dietitian, with your uh, online. You have so many training sessions that are going on, and try to fix a schedule. The only thing that we can do is consistently, at least for five days in a week, work out for at least thirty-five to forty-five minutes, so that you give your body that chance to lose weight. And the best way is to go by a calorie restriction. Please don't follow fad diets like keto or paleo because these are all short term and it's not good for you in the long term. So the best way is to reduce your calorie intake, increase your workout time, and then you should definitely see results. Uh, the next question we have is: It is possible to treat hyperandrogenism without pills? Unfortunately, no. The only way see this comes at a root cause of having PCO. So when the fat cells in your body start changing. into this male hormones that's when your insulin resistance increases because of which again there skin darkening on the neck or the thighs and there is hyperandrogenism so if you have a facial hair issue the best way to go about it especially when you're young is going for a laser because laser destroys the follicles so there's nothing to act on but other than that you have to take pills okay uh doesn't medicine like pco care work sorry does a medicine like pco care work PCO care. I mean, I'm not sure about the medicine that you're talking about, but like I said, if it is a supplement, they do have certain good because basically supplements are all antioxidants and good multi multi vitamins. So they may work along with your your effort that you put in. Um, how to manage pain due to fibroadenoma with a painkiller? Now the only thing that you can do is you can use hot water pack if you want. That does work. You do have pain patches that you get, but that's not long term. So there's no harm in taking a painkiller once, you know, once in a while. Why do you want to suffer? Um, there's an endometriosis uh, kind of a cyst at stage four, and what is the treatment and what precautions could be taken? At stage four, at stage four, something which is. the the last stage of endometriosis okay and uh, if the cyst is small basically we put you on tablets for 3 months to 6 months and see whether it reduces in size if the cyst is large it's always better to go in for surgery and at stage 4 it's something that you know we put in the patient the main two ways where endometriosis can stop one is pregnancy and one is menopause so the only treatment for this for a long term is that your period stop that's the aim and treatment that we stop your uterus from actually shedding so other than that you have nothing else to do right now if you are at stage 4 then you need to get your scanning done yearly make sure that you get your pain medications and uh, talk to your doctor about other ways by which you can prevent this from spreading um is it normal to have painful periods after marriage sorry is, is it? it normal to have painful periods after marriage see painful periods actually they say that ovulatory cycles are painful so there's nothing wrong in having painful periods it's normal because your uterus is cramping and definitely pain will be there but only if it is very you know your, your pain threshold is that uh, even if it's high even if the pain is really bad that you can't tolerate it even with medication it doesn't come down or taking rest or drinking warm water or doing all you know exercises also doesn't come down then you should definitely meet your doctor next question we have as if one has a bicorn uterus how safe are iud's one with a bicorn uterus i didn't get your question bicorn uterus that's the question here yeah for a bicorn uterus unfortunately if you need to put an iud you need to put in two iud's one in each corner so only one will not work because you have another cavity which definitely if you get pregnant in then there's no use of using a cavity 
Um, the next question we have is what can be done if one has fatty liver problems after childbirth and facing severe pain on the right side of the ribs? On the right side of the ribs. Okay, I'm not able to see where your questions are. So uh, this is actually a private question. Do you want me to uh, repeat the okay, question? Okay, 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 fine. So what was this question? Uh, what can be done? If one has a fat liver problem after childbirth okay, okay. and is facing severe pain in the right side of the rib. Yeah. So fatty liver again is something that we're coming across very, very frequently. I think we should blame Swiggy for half of it because our diets are changing a lot. And you know what food that we eat on weekends, all these things actually make a big difference. So try to cut down on outside food, drink a lot of water, make sure that you are, uh, you know, you'll get your liver function test done yearly once. And it will reduce as and when your diet also changes. So a lot of green leafy vegetables, a lot of colored fruits and vegetables definitely help in reducing this. Is it uh, okay or safe to use pantyliners regularly? It is, but the only thing is, again, there is friction. So because of which there can be darkening of the skin or there can be any kind of redness of the skin, which can cause inflammation and pain later on. Uh, is it common to have vomiting during periods? Not common, but yes, some people do have. All right. There's another question, which is if PCOD goes away and what can be done as a prevention? If PCOS goes away? Yes, and if there are preventive measures? I wish PCOD would go away from everybody, but unfortunately it can't. It's something that you, it sticks on. It's a metabolic disorder, so it's like diabetes. So if you're diagnosed with diabetes, we can't reverse it back. We can control it. So that way you can do these things that I've told you and control it so that you don't have any kind of effects of PCO. Okay. Um, I think this is more of a message. I'll just read it out. So far I've experienced periods with very less flow only once, uh, but later after 20 days got proper periods. Is it something of concern? Is it due to weight loss or exercise changes? See, in a year that is 12 cycles doesn't have to be the same. Nine cycles can be regular. Two to three cycles can be irregular in the sense you can have prolonged periods or you can have a delay or you can have very less flow. So don't get too worried about that. Only if it happens very regularly or consecutively, that's when you need to meet your doctor. Um, there's a person who says there's a 20 kg uh, rise in body weight after the delivery. And how can they lose it with while breastfeeding? Again, while breastfeeding, if you are less than six, if your child is less than six months, just give it a break. Don't break your head upon losing weight now because your baby needs your nutrition. Once the baby is done with six months of exclusive breastfeeding, that's when you need to start. Starting off with normal walking is the best thing, like I said. Calorie restriction in the sense, avoid fats, avoid too much of carbohydrates, but you can have protein. That is something that will definitely increase your BMR and help you lose weight. But at a gradual phase, so 20 kgs is not going to lose in like five months. If you do that, if you lose 20 kgs in five months, it may be great. You might feel great at that point. But you have a lot of other problems like hair fall, your skin sagging, a lot of other uh, you know, physical problems that you will get into because of the sudden lo loss in weight. So take it gradually as one to two kgs in a month and in a year you should be back. Right. Um, does drinking warm or slightly hot water lead to fine lines? Lead to fine lines. No, no, it doesn't. Um, so this is another message. I have PCOS and thyroid have gone through IVF which failed. My egg quality is not that great. Is there any way you can help? Unfortunately, again, egg quality is as old as we are. The AMH tells us exactly how much reserve we have. And in case if the quality is not good, the only thing that your doctor can give you is something known as coenzyme Q10. And these things are antioxidants and cell energizers that can help to a little extent. But I don't want to give you false promises in the sense it will definitely make it better. But the only other option to go will be a donor. But right now, uh, your diet should be the ones like I told you, your rich nutrition, high antioxidant diet definitely changes a little bit. And uh, increase in your exercise also increases the blood flow to the ovaries and uterus. So that also has a positive impact. Right. 
Um, the next question is that um, I have a pain in right lower abdomen. Should I need to get, like, do I need to get diagnosed? If the pain is consistent, if it keeps recurring, if you feel uncomfortable when you're sitting, working, then definitely meet a doctor. It could be either a renal calculi or it could be appendicitis also or an ovarian cyst. So don't ignore that. But if it is something that comes on and off and you 80% of the times you're fine, then I don't think it should be a problem. Um, the next question is, after my marriage, I have severely been suffering from acne. I'm 25 now and I have been married for two years. No medicines or creams are working. Uh, can there be any other un underlying health issues? Yeah, so acne, mostly patients who say that you know, nothing is working topically with acne, a root cause could be polycystic ovaries. So only when you take medication which has anti-acne effects, it will definitely come down. So meet a gynecologist, get checked once, and they will help you out too. Uh, do we require chemotherapy treatment if the ovarian cyst is not completely removed after surgery? Chemotherapy. That it depends on. See, it depends on the stage or what kind of findings they had during surgery. So if sometimes if they can take out the whole entire thing without spilling anything, without any other extra growths, then it may not be required depending on your stage. But otherwise, definitely they will tell you either chemo or what, uh, which kind of therapy is required for you. And it's always better to take it. Um, I think this is another commonly asked question. How to prevent stretch marks uh, during weight loss? Now, skin is not elastic, right? So only if it was elastic, we would be very happy. But unfortunately, it's not. And lightening, yes, you have a, other creams with aloe vera and olive oil and palm oil, your, your coconut oil. All these kind of things do lighten it, but definitely you cannot avoid it. So we have to just deal with it then. Um, right. We'll just take up uh, one more question because we are running out of time. Yeah. Uh, Fatigue, sleep abnormality and ability to lose weight easily is there anything serious again i think you should get checked for polycystic ovaries so it let us give you why you're having these problems and you'll be on a more serious track on how to deal with them right um, thank you we got a lot of questions and thank you dr Deepa, for actually answering them so patiently yeah. uh, for the ones who are asking how to reach out to the doctor we'll be sending out an email with the details and uh, from nova we do have such recurring sessions so we'll just send out a quick survey that you could fill in regarding what kind of sessions you would want to attend and if you have any feedback. We are also doing um, tax planning and mental health wellness one sessions on the next weeks. So please um, fill in the survey form for us. Thank you everyone for joining. I think uh, this will be it. And uh, I'd also invite you, uh, people also uh, to give them a little uh, insight from their side. So, Sharanya. Hi, sorry, can you repeat what you said? There was some disturbance. No, I, I would like uh, UV, uh, you can introduce about UV as well uh, for those yeah. people who are asking for doctor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Noah, for helping us conduct this session. And thank you, Doctor, for taking time of your busy schedule to do this session with us. And uh, a little bit about UV, we're a digital therapeutics platform, as you mentioned. We focus on chronic conditions and we offer very personalized and holistic care for any person who has conditions such as PCOS or thyroid. And our approach to is to always provide a personalized care to any woman. So it we take care of what are their needs, what are their concerns, and not uh, go for a very run-of-the-mill approach. That's why we also have doctors such as Dr. Deepa who work with us very closely to deal with our patients. So you can book a session with her via our platform, or you can download the app and book a session with her. Like um, uh, I think Aisha mentioned, they will be sharing uh, details via email tomorrow. So hope, uh, hopefully you can book a session with Dr. Deepa at the earliest. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Doctor, for the very informative session. I uh, we had a lot of questions and a lot of things uh, that you shared with us. Yeah. So, uh, again, thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, thank you. It was very interactive. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll be ending the session right now. Bye. Have a good night.